Okay. Uh, hi, and welcome to Jen Silverman's book event at Toadstool. I'm going to do the intro. My name is Swan Huntley, and I'm going to do the intro because Elise at Toadstool is having some technical issues today. So, um, and, and it has valiantly appeared on the phone, um, on cellular data. So, so nice to see you all. I'm going to start by reading Jen's bio. And then, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what I know about Jen. So Jen Silverman is a New York based writer and playwright. She is the author of the story collection, The Island Dwellers, which was long listed for a Penn Robert W. Bingham prize for debut fiction. Her plays have been produced across the United States and internationally. And she also writes for television and film. She is a two-time McDowell Colony fellow, a member of New Tra Dramatists and the recipient of a New York Foundation for the Arts grant a Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Fellowship, the Yale Drama Series Award, and a Playwrights of New York Fellowship, among other things, I would add. Um, and I'm just gonna start by saying, so the reason that we're doing this event at Toadstool is because Jen and I met at the artist residency that is in the same small town as Toadstool, which is Peterborough, New Hampshire. And the residency is called McDowell, the McDowell colony, or it's no longer colony. I'm sorry, they've cut that out. It's just McDowell now. And Jen and I met there in, I guess, it was, I think it was 2013. So almost 10 years ago, which is, I was saying to Jen before we logged on here, which is just nuts. And, and, um, and so today in preparation for doing this, I was just reflecting back on who we were 10 years ago and where life was and, and how things are now. And I would say that we're pretty much the same people, but um, under different, hopefully better circumstances. Um, I remember when I first met Jen, it was, so at McDowell, they have, um, I forget what it's called. Like the, oh, I think it's called the hall. I believe it used to be called Colony Hall. So I don't know if it's still Colony Hall or just the hall now. We'll call it the hall. I met Jen in the hall on this like great big leather couch. It's the first time I really remember like clocking her as a person. And I remember for some reason, sexuality came up and like we both discovered that we were queer. I think I said I was gay and Jen said she was queer and we were suddenly like, oh, you, you're now <laughs> substantially more interesting to me. What else is going on with you? Um, but beyond that, um, I just found Jen from the very beginning to be uh, such a keen observer of everything and so, so incredibly kind. It's <laughs> like, I'm going to cry saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember in particular, like this, the, one of the first times that we, we hung out at McDowell, I was having like, <laughs> I was going through this, you know, um, a lot of emotions around this thing I was writing and, and, I remember talking about it with Jen and talking about what she was working on. I remember too, you, there is this um, tradition at McDowell of sharing work and uh, there is always going, going into the experience of seeing the work of somebody who you've just met and who you like is always kind of a little bit of a gamble because you're like, oh my God, I really hope I like what you're making too. <laughs> you know, um, that's not, that's not always the case. It's, it's, you know, it's just can often be surprising. And I remember when Jen and Max Posner, another playwright who's still kicking around, um, and I forget who else, like read a scene or several scenes from one of Jen's plays. I can't remember what it was. And I just, I remember being like, oh my God, what is going on inside this person's head? Like, I want to know so much more. I just, um, it, it just in that there was such an elegance of language and uh, a wry humor and, and an absurdist spirit that, that I think is all in this novel um, and, is, and is in all of Jen's work, um, which I've become familiar with over the years. And when I read this book, when I read this novel, I was like, Jen, dude, this is you. Like this novel is just so you, it's just perfectly, um, perfectly you, the, the, the theme and the rhythms of the language. And I'm just um, so, so happy that, um, to be here with you. 
um, friend. So I should also preface by saying that everything I say about Jen is going to be totally, completely biased because I love her so much. But even if I didn't, you should know that this book is really legitimately good and that, uh, and I, I would think that even if I didn't know Jen. Um, <laughs> Jen, do you want to read a small portion of the book that you have prepared? Yeah, I'll read. This is a very brief segment. Um, and this, so the book, as you probably know, since you're here, is We Play Ourselves. Um, and it begins with a playwright character who is in the wake of a massive scandal and she flees from New York to LA to try and reinvent her life. Um, and while she's in LA, she falls in with this charismatic but manipulative filmmaker who is making a sort of fight club-esque movie with these teenage girls. Um, and the section that I'm going to read is just, it's about two minutes long uh, from the beginning, toward the beginning of the book. Another acquaintance of mine, a, a playwright, became a parent last year. When I asked her how it was, she said that the thing nobody tells you is that suddenly you are a person whose unguarded heart now moves through the world, embedded inside a small and breakable body. You want to stuff it back inside you. Almost every day you want to swallow it whole, but you can't. And day by day it gets bigger, more unwieldy. Making a play is like this. It is only different in that your heart, which is now moving in the world outside of you, does not reside in the body of a singular creature. It resides inside the bodies of a strange troop of individuals who have signed up for this ritual, who by agreement have become something precious and unnameable. You will love these people savagely beyond language for the moment in time in which all of you are bound to each other. If they love you similarly, it will be with similar caveats. There is no intimacy like the intimacy of breathing life into something together, mingling breath. There's nothing like sharing creation. For the months in which we are assembled, the only people we feel connected to are the ones who joined us inside this world. There might be a legal contract that says we have all agreed to play pretend for eight or 10 weeks after which this will stop. But we are human and we forget how time works. Our entire lives are possible only because we have taught ourselves this trick of lying about time. If we thought about the truth, that every morning we wake up is a morning bringing us closer to death, we wouldn't get out of bed. So we live in this room together with a headlong intensity that approximates forever, because these are the moments that make us want to live at all. And so somewhere between how much we need each other and how singularly we share a world that no one else shares, we forget that we will not always share this one impenetrable world. And because we forget, we love. Tell me you don't understand that and I won't believe you. You don't have to work in the theater to be an accomplished liar to yourself. In fact, if you have survived this long, it's because you too are a practitioner of that ancient skill. You forget and you forget and you love. Oh my gosh, so good, <laughs> so good. Um, I mean, your love for theater, it's just so apparent in these pages. It, it, makes, it makes theater seem so sexy. I have never wanted to go to the theater more as uh, reading this book during a pandemic when I can't go into the theater. Yeah. Um, and maybe we should just start there. I mean, I wonder, um, how, how is, is, how, what are your feelings about theater now? And, and how do you plan to make work differently in the future when the world opens back up? Yeah. Oh man, those are big questions. I mean, in so many ways, I, I, I mean, the, a year of, of theater being closed institutionally, theater being closed, um, has changed a lot of the ways that I thought about it. I mean, I miss it. I miss doing it. Uh, I miss seeing other people's shows, that kind of electric, intimate gathering that can only happen inside a theater. Um, and also, theater is the opposite of a soundbite. You know, I feel like when you are sitting grappling with a set of ideas durationally over time, intimately around other people. I mean, that's the opposite of this sort of like lack of nuance that I think we're seeing more and more in any kind of like cultural discourse, right? Like we, we're in a world where we're inundated with sound bites at every moment and often sound bites out of context and theater sort of is context. It is a way to think deeply and over time um, about something. And I, and I miss that and I value that. And so in terms of the, you know, your second question of how do I make work going forward, I think 
particularly because writing books has become part of my practice and that's part of my practice that that I really love I think that the things I make in a theater for me can only be things that live in a theater like if something could be a tv show if it could be a book if it could be a film then it doesn't need to be a play but but when but when I think about what I want to make next it's something that can only happen in that kind of live electric durational space um and that's kind of how I'm judging projects from now on. <laughs> right. Um, well, I look forward to seeing what, what you make um, next and, and to the experience of us all going back into the theater um, and talking about working in multiple forms. I mean, I remember when I met you, you were a playwright. Uh, these are the order in which I knew things. You were a playwright who had some poems who also had some short stories. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so there's some other stuff brewing in here. I, what, and and now, now, almost 10 years later, this has expanded to a career in film and TV. And and you, I still don't know where your sh collection of sh uh, poems, Jen's home room will have a collection of poetry at some point is what I'm gonna say. I don't know what happened to this, um, but it's astounding to me how many things, uh, in how many different mediums you're working. And I'm wondering um, how, how the expansion of forms has fed your creative process and um, and how you have been toggling between them in the pandemic. Well, the first thing I want to say is, is and Swan, I, I hope you remember this, is that you are one of the people who is directly responsible for this novel being in the world because you took one of my stories that I think you had read in McDowell or I had shared it with you because we started reading each other's first drafts of things and you shared it with your agent at the time who then became and is, is still my agent. Um, and, and who said to me, this is a collection of stories. Do you have other stories? Let's put them together. And that was my first book with Random House. Um, and, and We Ourselves was the second book. So you are, you are the catalyst for basically all of, all of what this became. Um, the working in multiple forms, I mean, I, you know, we've talked a lot about this over the years together. Like, I think, it's become so central to me as I think about like, what are the stories that I need to tell and what are the forms in which I need to tell them? Um, that there was a time in which I sort of only did theater um, and, I, and I was a bit of a purist about it. Like I, I was less interested in engaging with TV or film or I didn't entirely know what that would be and I wasn't looking in that direction. And Theater is a form, any form, is a form that has limitations. Um, but, but what I realized was that when I was trying to put in the container of theater stories that maybe needed to live in other ways, I, like there was only so far you could get with what you were trying to make. Whereas like now I can think, so is, you know, am I making something that requires that sort of physical intimacy and proximity and, and present tenseness of theater? Am I making something that is actually um, quieter, more visually driven, um, something that needs to live in eight to 10 episodes. Like you really need to spend time with these characters in, in a sort of a very durational way. Or am I making something that in order to thrive needs the tight container of film? Like they're now structure and content are inextricable to me. Um, and the ability, I think, for any writer to practice in multiple fields is really the ability to find the most perfect container for what that story needs to be. Mm -hmm. And you do this as well. I mean, you're an essayist, you're a cartoonist, you know, like you are a TV writer now, you have a pilot, like there's, there, you are also sort of, I've been watching you over 10 years, find these multiple access points to different containers, which is really thrilling. Thanks, Jen. Um, <laughs> You, uh, tying this back into the story I, um, uh, of this book, I mean, <clears throat> so this is, uh, if, if somebody on this list hasn't read this book, pl please go buy the book immediately. But it, it is about um, uh, a playwright who we meet in the aftermath of a scandal and she's fled to Los Angeles, as I think Jen opened with, to, um, to, to start over. And kind of the, the plot question of the book is can she get over her immense shame and, and, and make a comeback? Um, and part of the fun of reading the book is that we don't know what the scandal at the center of the story was for, I think it's halfway, around halfway through that we find out what that was. Um, and there's this kind of fun, like narrative nod that happens where it's a very close first person and the, and the and Cass is like, 
I'm almost going to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you yet. So just hang on. When I found out what the scandal was, I died because it was so perfect. I don't want to use any other descriptive words um, other, other than perfect um, for fear of saying too much. But I mean, this all had me thinking a lot about um, the difficulty of being an artist and of maintaining one's own voice during that journey. And, and I mean, to tie that back into what you were just saying, I think that working in multiple forms is perhaps a way to mitigate failure um, or at least a way to spread failure across multiple forms. Um, I wonder though, uh, well, I have two questions about this. Let, let's go back to the, the shame and the scandal bit. I think that as a culture, we seem to be obsessed with this idea of uh, you know, a fall from grace and a, and a sub subsequent potential comeback. Like, will they come back? I mean, in that Tiger Woods documentary, he came back like seven times in the span of, of four hours. This documentary is on HBO Max. Wait, or I think it's on Hulu now, if you haven't seen it. Um, or, you know, Britney Spears. Like, is she going to come back? What's going to happen? We seem to be obsessed with this. And I'm wondering what drew you to this subject? Well, it is, I mean, as you're saying, it is so embedded in the culture, this American obsession with um, ambition, success, and the ways in which the stories about people who achieve comebacks are sort of held up to us. Um, and Tiger Woods being a perfect example. But, you know, it's interesting is when I try to think about women who have had a massive public humiliation of some kind and then come back, it is so hard for me because Brittany has not come back. You know what I mean? Like Monica Lewinsky, she had to change her entire life. And now she is, you know, making a real, um, she's using her platform in a way that I think is really remarkable. And she is clearly an intelligent, sophisticated thinker who is finally being recognized as an intelligent, sophisticated thinker, but it has taken her decades and decades to stop being dismissed by the public at large, you know? So, so when I think about the, who are the women that have overcome a scandal of any sort of public proportion, I find it almost impossible to think of one. Um, and, and so some of what the interrogation of the book was or is, is this question of like, if as a woman, you fail in a way that is, scandalous, juicy, total. People want to talk about it. They are, your humiliation is sort of up for constant cultural discussion. Then do you attempt to come back? Do you attempt to like get back to what you had or are you forced to completely reinvent your life? Like if no comebacks available, is it just to go forward? And what does that look like? Um, and how does your sense of self get completely reconfigured by being perceived as a laughing stock, a joke, a failure. Like when you start to think of yourself as a failure, what does that do to the way you move through the world? Um, and Cass as a character is sort of begins in the aftermath um, of this failure and, and then sort of moves in a few different directions, trying a comeback, trying to sort of um, reinvent herself under a different name, you know, and, and, and that leads her to in a different direction. So, so those, those questions were really on my mind are on my mind in general as I sort of watch any sort of popular culture play out, but but with this book particularly were. Yeah, and I um, something that I love about reading this book is that it's about Cass's internal, I, I mean, you, when you go through one of these scandals, there's the, the internal work that needs to be done, um, the, the shame that needs to be internally um, res resolved in some way, and then, and then what happens to the artistic career um, and, and how those things mirror each other or don't. And um, part of what happens to Castanelli is that she meets this charismatic filmmaker who draws her in a new direction, which um, uh, I'm, I'm not wanting to spoil anything. <laughs> it's hard to talk about that arc eventually. because <laughs> It is. Um, I guess, maybe I'll blow this up in a bigger picture way and just say that as, as young artists, which, which Cash, Cass is, Cash, Cass is a young artist, it, it's very, um, it can be very difficult to maintain one's vision in the 
in, in this current landscape. You know, there, there's a lot of pressure to be commercial, say. And <clears throat> I mean, maybe let's tie this back into you. Like you have always, since the day I met you, struck me as the most self-possessed person, the most <laughs> clear person who like, you've never been like, oh, maybe I'll like write a really commercial commercial novel. Like you've never said that. You're just like, no, this is what I'm doing. And what you're doing is, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it is widely appealing, but there's also a weirdness to it. I would say, so your work across, across your body of work, a weirdness to varying degrees. Um, and I've actually never asked you this question, Jen Silverman, but have you ever found yourself in a moment of feeling pulled to make a choice that wasn't necessarily aligned with your deeper intentions um, in the spirit of being popular? Like, you know, um, maybe especially when you were in a vulnerable moment earlier in your career, which is we meet Cass in such a vulnerable moment in her journey. I mean, yes, of course. And I think, I think a few things. I loved what you said earlier about working in multiple forms being a way to spread failure across multiple fields. I actually think there's something really valuable in that because in order to make things that are honest or relevant or daring or that push forward the conversation that you're trying to push forward, whether it's an aesthetic one or you know, a political or personal one, you have to be willing to fail. And I think that I've made a lot of things on, in the process to making other things or, or to learning how to make them that are in and of themselves, I would not say that they were successful works. And yet I had to make them to learn how to make the next thing. But, but I think like when everything that you make and particularly as a young artist and particularly as somebody you know who is only working in one field, and I'm thinking of when I was, you know, only writing plays, every single thing was like, this will make your career or it will end your career. I'm not sure that was actually true, but that's how it felt. And so with that as kind of the cloud hanging over any process, and particularly in the States where, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but the arts economy is, is, one of great scarcity, you know, there is no government funding or, or very little government funding. Any institution that takes a gamble on an artist is taking a real financial gamble. Um, and particularly as a playwright, any theater that is programming your play, like if they lose ticket revenue, they will feel it and then you will feel it. Um, so there's all of these ways in which failure becomes something to be penalized for as opposed to a necessary experience or a necessary risk, you know? Um, and, and part of what has felt very freeing to me in terms of working in multiple fields and multiple genres is that like, if I make something and I make it to the best of my ability and I make it with all of my um, daring and desire to risk and it fails, like, and? You should make the next thing. And, and if the next thing isn't, you know, if the next thing can't be a book, then it's a play. If it can't be a play, it's a TV show. If it can't be a TV show, it's like make an opera, you know, whatever. But, th but that there's always a way to keep moving forward as an artist, as opposed to letting somebody tell you like, no, sit down. Your last thing was a failure. You're not economically viable anymore. You don't get to make work, you know? And I think that, again, speaking particularly about this country and this culture, there's a way in which young artists, or not young artists, any artists, particularly older artists as well, any artist who has made something that has lost money um, for the institution, it's, it's hard for, to, to let yourself keep moving in a forward direction you know, on your trajectory. And, and I think so much of what's important is making space for yourself to keep doing that. which you are doing beautifully. Um, <clears throat> that, that is a real learning curve. And that's something that I've, you know, recently I had a number of meetings with like, you know, young like playwriting students or younger playwrights. And, and that's sort of something that I have started talking to them about because it was never something that I recall, you know, that, that I heard. Um, I think it's only recently in my awareness that artists have, have been less siloed and have there's been more freedom to move between media and more people have done it. Yeah, right. 
Um, I think that's true. And I also love what you just said about failure. That's a necessary part of the process. Um, I have this feeling that we learn everything that we need to know in like kindergarten and then we forget it. And then we remember again, like at some other point. And, you know, we learn in kindergarten, like just be yourself, but it is really hard to get lost, especially when you're only working in one medium and when your finances depend on the success um, of, of, of that one medium working out. Um, it can be a, a landscape of personal scarcity. I mean, it's just, it can be really scary. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so I love what you just said about, you know, you knowing that, that you've made the best work and, and that's all, that's all you need to know. Um, and I, um, I, I know too, that you've had um, a, a relationship to public, uh, the public opinion about your work that has changed over the years, if I'm right about that, like at least as far as reading reviews. Um, Oh, maybe I didn't used to I didn't used to read any of them because I thought I felt that I needed to protect myself in my process in some way and then I started reading all of them and that was not particularly useful and then the thing that I finally found I guess now where I'm at is there's a certain at least in theater there's a, a certain set of critics who I find um sort of particularly nuanced and complex in terms of how they approach theater they don't always like we don't always agree. They don't always think I'm what I did with was something they liked, but but I do find their opinions to be interesting. And so there's like a small handful of people that I regularly read because I do want to know how they received something or, or how they perceived it. Um, and then otherwise I don't, and I kind of don't care. And I, I think what has become clear to me is like, if we're having the same artistic conversation, then I, I'm curious about what you think of what I made. Cause you might show it to me in a way that I didn't see before. You might show me something that I was blind to in terms of like where the piece could have been stronger or where it could go next. But if we're not having the same artistic conversation then, then we're not having a conversation, you know, like, like if, and that has become, I think particularly useful to clock because I mean, you mentioned sort of that a lot of my body of work used the word weird, which is totally fair. I think that I'm really drawn toward, particularly in theater, non-naturalistic, um, you know, dark comedy, absurdist styles of theater. Um, and it's taken me some time to realize that the critics and, and sort of the artistic leaders who, um, who can really help me understand the craft of what I'm doing and what it could be are people who are interested in that aesthetic. And there are a lot of people who, you know, are, are really um, tied to sort of a, a kind of rigorous naturalism and whose understanding of whether something succeeded or failed is, is how closely that thing was aligned to naturalism. And that's just not a conversation that, um, that I find particularly relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. I have other questions about, um reaction to your work, reaction to this novel, but I wanna make sure that we hit on a little more of the story of the novel since uh, we don't have much more time for me to ask you questions. Um, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about why, why the female fight club, um, which is what um, Caroline, the filmmaker that cast Meets in LA is, is filming a, a semi-documentary about a, Fight Club that involves teenage girls. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why you made that choice. Yeah, um, well, two things. First of all, so Carolyn as a character is somebody who, and without spoilers, I think I can say is somebody who, um, of the characters in the book, she understands the marketplace very clearly and very unapologetically. Uh, and while Cass is sort of like torn between all these questions of like authenticity and like representing what you're actually trying to do with your life and your art and whatever, Carolyn, in a way that is, I think, poised and cool and strategic, has said, this is what the marketplace wants. They want stories about young girls who, you know, are able to express their anger in ways that are like both sexy and titillating, but also empowering. Like she sort of just breaks down in a way that's, um, that Cass finds to be like shocking, but also like kind of refreshing, you know, what the commercial marketplace is looking for. And then she makes a thing that is that thing. So on the one hand, the female, the girl fight club um, came out of that, of sort of a, a cool assessment of the marketplace, but also 
there's a larger conversation in the book um, about anger, female rage, sort of, and, and the ways in which um, so often we are socialized to be, to put other people's comfort ahead of our own and not to be angry, not to be publicly angry, not to take up space. Um, and, and, you know, Cass really struggles with her anger and, and the scandal in part comes out of this moment in which she loses all of her socialization and conditioning and she does something that shocks herself and everyone else. Um, whereas with the Fight Club, these girls are, you know, a generation younger than she is. And I think at least when I, when I work with students, I, I'm really amazed at um, the vocabulary they have and the ease with which they express certain emotions. They talk about their vulnerability. They talk about their anger, you know, like it's a whole, it feels like being on a different planet in a way. And so some of the, the teen fight club is also this moment where Cass is surrounded by these girls who have a conditioning or, or um, a socialization that is entirely new to her. Um, yeah, there's more I want to say, but but spoilers, so I won't. But but that yeah, the Fight Club I think also becomes a conversation about um, these girls co-opting what was and deliberately co-opting what was previously masculine space. I had never thought about um, how. I mean, I guess the are, these girls are like Gen Z. I hadn't really thought about that yet, right? Yeah, uh, and. It, yeah, it's funny when you when you said when you just said that I was like, oh my god, we're not even that old, but we're like old. Like they're already doing it so differently just behind us. It truly really is amazing. Um, I thought that too when I watched that sh the show Generation, um, which is about Gen Z. I was like, what? I feel old. What is going on? Um, uh, there is. I mean, well, where do I want to go from here? I still have to watch Generation, I will say. Yeah, you need to watch it. It's on my list. Um, so, something that I said to you about this book is that, um, so you had been to LA several times. You've been to LA a bunch of times for meetings and, and it, yeah, et cetera. Um, but you had never lived here for an extended period until until the point at which you wrote this book. And I, one of my first reactions to it was, this is like Jen's, um, you know, this is a timestamp of a very specific time in your life. Like, I'm not sure that you would write the same book about Los Angeles now. There's there's this sense of being disoriented. I remember specifically a, a passage in which the hills are described as swaying. It, like, it's it just seems like the, a different planet. Um, and I'm wondering what it was like for you to write this book during the time that you did. Yeah, I mean, I as you as as you said, I had been to LA you know, for 48 hours here and there, you know, for TV stuff. Um, but I'd never really spent any time there. I'd never rented a place there. I was, you know, so usually staying like in hotels, like, you know, so there was a way in which showing up and I had moved to LA right at the beginning of writing this book. Cause I was in, um, the, the writer's room for tales of the city, the reboot on Netflix. And so there's a way in which showing up in LA was incredibly disorienting. Um, beginning, a new job I'd never written in a TV room before that, but also being in a new city where, I mean, LA, we've talked about this before, but LA is such a strange place if you come from, well, anywhere else, but especially the East Coast. I mean, the light is so specific, the plants are so specific. Like I would walk down the street outside my Airbnb and I would see plants where I was like, I don't even know the name for that. You know, like I've never seen that before in my life. And it felt a little bit, I think I said this to you once we were taking a walk once, but it felt, I felt like I had been dropped in the middle of Jurassic Park. Um, like all of these like tall, weird, spiky things. I was like, where are the dinosaurs, you know? So, so there was a real disorientation and, and almost a thrilling disorientation in moving there. And I think part of what was so helpful about starting the book right then, um, was that it gave me a place to put that disorientation and in finding language for all of these sort of sensory experiences that felt new or these, um, this experience of dislocation inside like a whole new city grid, like in finding language for that, it helped me kind of pin myself to the place. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, I remember you were like, I hate LA. And I was like, I don't know if you hate LA. And then later you were like, actually, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> um, I became one of those New Yorkers who was like, yeah, LA is great. <laughs> I know. I love it so much. There's also, um, just for all of you who, if you're not familiar with LA, there is, it's actually down the street for me. There's a smoothie place called the punch bowl. And there is a pivotal scene in the book that happens at the punch bowl. And every time I walk by now, I just think, uh, uh, I just think of the color lime green. And if you know what I'm talking about, then, then, then you do. And if not, then you need to read the book to find out. But a pivotal moment happens at the punch bowl. Um, I'm wondering what else for you was, um, was, was a surprise about writing a novel or, or what else was the most rewarding did you find? as you were writing it? The not knowing how to do something was really kind of exhilarating and terrifying. And I remember you and I would take these long walks around Silver Lake Reservoir. And I would say to you like, what's a novel? How are you supposed to write a novel? I don't even know what a novel is. How long is a novel? And you had already emailed me twice and you've been like, a short novel is this number of words. A medium novel is this number of words. A long novel. And so, but you just like very generously kept being like, well, these are the numbers, but it doesn't really mean anything. And then I'd be like, okay, okay, that's what a novel is. You know, and then I would like go home and I would Google what is a novel. It just, it was, I was so disoriented in that form, sort of as well as the geography um, of the new city. But, but there is something really, yeah, I guess this, the word is exhilarating about not knowing how to do a thing yet, because then you don't know what you're not allowed to do or what you can't do. Um, and that every discovery is a discovery you're making without a voice in your head saying like, oh, well, that's not the way to do it. Like somebody else would have done it better. You just don't know. So you're like on a journey um, in a really present tense way. Again, the beauty of working in a slightly foreign form or not your primary form that you went to school for. Yeah. Um, and yes, I do remember you being like, that. how many pages <laughs> is it? You wanted like numbers. <laughs> um, like how do you know when you're done? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm wondering, I haven't asked you this. I'm wondering if there's anything that has been surprising to you about how this book has been received. Like what has been surprising to you about the post-publication portion? I mean, I had all of these fears, these real anxieties once the book was like in galleys. Cause up until the book being in galleys, it didn't feel like a real thing. I was just doing a thing that I wanted to do. I was writing it, I was by myself. You know, like I was talking to my editor, but it was, it, there was a sort of an intimate bubble that was created around this thing. So I actually, it didn't occur to me to think about anyone else encountering it, even though of course that is what publication is. Um, but once it became real to me that other people were gonna read it, then I had all of this anxiety around theater people reading it. Um, and the book, of course, you know, is fiction, but I was like, well, what if people think that they are a character that I didn't mean for them to be, or, or what if, you know, People, like theater people have a bad reaction to it or what if you know like I just sort of went down the spiral and what has been sort of amazing to me and, and really um really fun is that a lot of theater people have been reading it and reaching out and and particularly in this moment where you know theaters are still closed and, and we've been so isolated there's been this feeling of community that's been growing around the book in a way that I really didn't expect um I was on, um, I was on a thread with a couple of friends not long after the book came out, and they were sort of pitching to me themselves as various characters. Also, like I had been expecting the thing, and I have received the thing. Or people are like, I know who Tara Jean Slater is, and then they give me like ten different names, and everyone who has their list of names, like there's rarely an overlap. There are so many Tara Jean Slaters <laughs> in the world. It turns out, right. but the thing that I hadn't yet experienced until that thread was people being like, "I am Tara Jean Slater." I am Carolyn. I was like, embrace it. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, that, I hadn't heard that. That is so great. It was great. <laughs> um, yeah, gosh, the Tara Jean Slater character is so, I mean, she just, I think I can say this part. I think I can say this. And it won't be a spoiler, but she just doesn't care at all. She's like, <laughs> 
seemingly doesn't care and she's doing so well. I mean, it's infuriating. <laughs> um, there are so many other details to discover about her. So that is, that is merely one of them. Um, and I think I, well, okay. I'm going to ask one more quick question. This will be easy to answer. And then I know that at 3.45 or 6.45, we, we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions. But the one, this is a craft question that I was personally wondering and have been meaning to ask you. So this book is written in two timelines. Um, there's a past timeline and a present timeline for a good portion of the book. And I'm wondering what your process was for writing that. Meaning, did you write it in sequence basically or did you copy paste? I wrote it. I'm trying to remember this fully. I think for the most part, I wrote it in sequence. Like, and then at a certain point I realized, and, and to clarify the past present, the present tense is the LA story where Cass has arrived in LA. She's attempting to rebuild her life. She meets Carolyn. All of that is present tense moving forward. And then simultaneously, we're getting flashbacks to New York um, leading up to this big scandal. And then briefly in the aftermath of the scandal. And, uh, and yeah, so when I, I started writing it, I was writing it sort of, in the sequence that it is in the book, but at a certain point I realized that my structure was all off. Um, and then I had to do, like you've seen me do this a hundred times, but I had to do the thing where, you know, you put, you print out all the pages and you put them on the floor and you put post-it notes on everything and you rearrange everything and things become like a color coded, you know, complete nightmare and nobody can walk on the floor between the couch and the window because it's covered in paper. And, and part of that was finding a way like I remember moving entire chapters backward in time or moving things forward in time and finding a way where those two threads of New York and LA um, could feed each other, but not sort of interrupt each other, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it was messy. I think a lot of time was spent, particularly at the beginning, throwing stuff out, like writing a hundred pages and then throwing out 40, you know, or, or sort of going in. I threw out the entire, I mean, the, the third, the book is in three parts and the third part of the book it used to be set in Australia in the first draft. Um, and then I threw out that complete part and rewrote the current part, which is not set in Australia. Mm -hmm. Well, Jen, you've written a great book. And I think we are going to turn it over to the audience now. I don't know. Um, and I guess Elise, Elise, turning it back over to you if your internet is still good. Yeah, um so there's no questions in the chat room yet um so i guess if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions directly they might feel more comfortable doing that it's also okay to have no questions <laughs> it's a monday <laughs> my questions are mostly reserved for the end of the week when i ask myself what i've done with my life <laughs> i feel that <laughs> I think we can give people a couple of minutes to think about questions and, and just sort of wrap up on our end. And then if there's questions, we can answer them more. If not, we can release everyone out into the night or mid afternoon if you're in LA, you lucky bird. I'll ask just one more question while people are, oh. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask just this one. Oh, we're done. I'm gonna ask the one question anyway. Um, the, the character of Jocelyn, uh, who, who is Cass's agent's assistant, um, was somebody who was mentioned just one, I expected this to be a character who was just going to come in for like one scene and who we would never see again. And it really surprised me how often she kept coming back and what her role ended up becoming. And I'm wondering if you had planned that from the get-go or if that was a character who kind of blossomed for you as you were writing it. Definitely didn't plan that. Um, and the so the throughout the beginning of the book, Cass is sort of calling her agent repeatedly, trying to get a hold of her. Post scandal, the agent has said, "Never call me again." Um, and and so while Cass is is calling this agent who won't pick up, she keeps getting the assistant who is tasked with the difficult job um, of sort of saying like, "Oh, she's not here right now. She'll try you back." And then finally, Jocelyn just levels with her and says like, "You're on the do not call list. Like this is not going to happen." And and from there. Cass starts calling to talk to Jocelyn and the two of them sort of form this um, like odd little sister, big sister relationship in some ways. And I think, yeah, I had sort of thought that, that Jocelyn would, would show up in, in just one scene. And then 
she kind of took on her own voice um, because she's also somebody who is contending in a different way from Cass, but with these questions of success and failure um, that Cass is contending with. I mean, Jocelyn is 22 and she's, you know, an assistant at a large agency. She's watching talent come in that's her age and she's the one who has to go get them water. Like there's a way she's asking, you know, when is it going to be my turn? Like, what am I going to do? Um, to, to put myself in a position where I feel like a success instead of somebody who's serving the successes. Um, and, and once I, I sort of plugged into that, to that character, then it was exciting to follow her. Yeah, I so enjoyed how that, the theme of failure, success, <clears throat> struggling to live an authentic life is mirrored in, in like, I would say all of these characters, um, including the people who Cass moves in with. And the Jocelyn just cracked me up. Um, I found the scenes with her to be so funny. So I think she was a, a real value add. Thanks. Um, you're welcome, Jen. <laughs> I'm gonna stop asking questions now and I don't, it seems like we don't have any other questions. So I feel like we can probably wrap up. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. And thank you to everyone who came out tonight to, to hang out with me and Swan Huntley. <laughs> So nice to see you all. Also just wants to thank everybody for coming in and um, for watching it. it. That was really nice of everybody to give you guys a nice audience there. Um, oh. I, yeah, yes, McDowell downtown. So cool. <laughs> I'm reading the chats now. Mm -hmm. Very cool, um, have a good day. I guess. Um, this is and everything and thank you guys for coming and having this conversation for our audience. It's our pleasure and thank, thank you, you for you. joining us. <laughs> good luck with your internet. Yes, at least good luck with the internet. <laughs> <I'm> trying. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.